so I would like to open this um, fireside chat by celebrating and acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land in Australia uh, that Suzanne Corey and I are joining you from today. These are the Wurundjeri people of the Cooling Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and I embrace their continued connection to this place. It always was, it is, and it always will be Aboriginal land. So now I'm um, um, delighted to welcome Professor Joan Stites, who looks like she's in her office at Yale University in New Haven, and uh, Suzanne, who's uh, like me, um, going to be chatting to us from her home in Melbourne. For me, this is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate these uh, ladies' extraordinarily important careers. And I'm delighted that they've agreed to reflect on those careers today and share some of their joint memories. So may I ask uh, how long uh, you two have known each other? Well, you know, I was calculating that this morning and I was astonished because it seems like only yesterday that it is 55 years since we met in Cambridge. And uh, it has been um, a voyage of a voyage in science, but not only that, a voyage of the world, because we have always made it a point to meet in beautiful places and go hiking. So that is how we've been able to renew our friendship over all these years. So Joan, where were you uh, when you first met? So we both were working at the uh, MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England. And Suzanne was doing her PhD there and I had just arrived for a postdoc. I think you were there slightly before I was, isn't that correct, Suzanne? Yeah. Yes, that is. Yes. So that was how we met. And um... well, so Suzanne, so, I so um... we sort of had a, a pre meeting in the sense that um, Joan and my future husband, Jerry Adams, and Tom Stites, Joan's husband, were all graduate students together in Harvard. And when Jerry and I got married in Melbourne before we went to, um, no, let me, let me backtrack on that. That's inaccurate. It's funny how things collide in your memory. <laughs> but anyway, those three had been um, graduate students in Jim Watson's lab at Harvard. And so um, when Tom, John and Tom- Not Tom, just Jer Jerry. Not Tom, Harvard. not in the Watson lab, but at Harvard, yes. And um, so, when Joan and Tom came to Harvard, it was sort of natural that um, we would all be introduced and, and start doing things together. But Joan and I ch shared a lab bench, actually, and how that came to happen is a great story that I think Joan should tell. Yes, okay. So the reason that I did a postdoc in the Mecca of X-ray crystallography was that I had already married a crystallographer. And there was no other place that he could possibly go. And they very much wanted to have him there. Uh, but when I arrived, it wasn't quite clear that there were really any plans. And Francis Crick told me, well, maybe you should do a literature project in the library. And I knew that uh, theory was not my forte in comparison to experiments. And so I set about talking to the many people working in the lab and figuring out, which turned out to be a great project that none of the men wanted because it was so challenging. They were afraid they wouldn't have results in two years, which was the usual postdoctoral time. So they wouldn't have anything to get a job back in the States, but it was a very interesting problem. So I decided to take it on and eventually it worked. That's amazing. and. Um... I mean, you, you know, you obviously right from the moment were determined to overturn other people's expectations of you. Um, and Suzanne, I don't know what was waiting for you because I think um, even now it's still extremely unusual 
for a young person to leave their home country to do their PhD. I mean, um, it's still a brave thing to do now. And, and all those years ago, it was quite curate, uh, curate, uh, courageous. Um, now, you told me there was, um, you know, one reason why you ended up there, um, just because you, you wrote a simple letter um, that someone had recommended you try. And so this was a shot in the dark completely, wasn't it? It, it certainly was. So if you go back, if, we, if I go back to uh, my master's study at the University of Melbourne, I had started to become more and more interested in science. And I went to my first scientific meeting and that really captured me. So I decided I would do my PhD, but I had a, counteract, a counteracting desire and that was to travel. Ever since I'd been very small, um, I had wanted to travel and see Europe. And so um, I decided that I would do my PhD, but I would not do it in Australia. I would do it overseas to give myself the opportunity of traveling. And then I thought, well, um, where will I do my PhD? And actually only one place occurred to me because I had fallen in love with DNA during my undergraduate studies. And I was absolutely fascinated by the DNA double helix. And so I thought, well, why not try it for the top? So I wrote this letter to Francis Crick and said, um, would you take me on as a PhD student? And much to my amazement, I eventually got this letter back saying yes. <laughs> now, I think that my professor of biochemistry might have had something to do with this. He might have visited Cambridge while he was traveling and um, spoken up for me. So, but I was still extraordinarily fortunate that Francis said yes and, in, and allowed me into his department to do my PhD. Because there weren't actually many PhD students at that time in the LMB, were there, Joan? And right. um, so, and it made such a difference to my entire life that, um, you know, I just look back on that letter and I think, how did you have the audacity to write this letter <laughs> and aim for going to that laboratory? And I think it was naivety. And so did you have an, a different experience when you arrived? Was there a proper project already lined up for you? Um, so I was interviewed by um, Francis Crick and Sydney Brenner, who were the joint directors of the department. And um, they said to me, um, well, we've decided that you will work on the structure of methionine tRNA-M. And um, this is the tRNA that puts methionine into internal positions in polypeptides. And so I said, and, and um, <laughs> um, Sydney in his very um, strong, typical um, monotone voice said, hmm, do you think you're up to it? <laughs> And I went after they described the project, which involved doing countercurrent distribution fractionation of um, bulk tRNAs, in which I had had no experience whatsoever. I sort of gulped to myself and said, "Yes, I think I could do that," but I was really very, <laughs> very <laughs> um, fearful of the project. And so um, I went off to Brian Clark's laboratory, who was going to be my PhD, direct PhD supervisor, and started the project. And, you know, um, like always in life, if you um, learn from people and just go from one day to the next, you actually get there in the end. So, um, Persistence, yeah. Um, so were there many other women there at the um, LMB at the time you arrived? No obvious female mentors or anything like that? Certainly no female mentors. Uh, yeah. no, no, and um, very few. Were there any women senior scientists, Joan? I don't remember that there were. I mean, not who had official positions, official right. senior positions. There were certainly some strong female scientists there, but I don't think they were given the recognition 
or the status that they um, actually deserved from what they had achieved. So up, up until that point, later, some of them were given more recognition, uh, crystallographers in particular, but yes. not so much the molecular biologists. Yeah. So, so I think we um, both pioneered in that department being female. Did you feel once you were there that you just had to work the whole time or did you still manage to have lots of fun and, um, you know, partake in the sort of opportunities that Cambridge had to offer at the time? We certainly partook of a lot of those things. We got interested in antique furniture and antique painting and used to scour the countryside for little antique shops that were selling things. And it was a good period to do that because the taxation structure had changed and all these country residences were sort of gushing out their contents. Uh, we did lots of that. We saw lots of lots of England and a little bit of Scotland and a little bit of Wales and it was it was wonderful. Real adventure. Speaking personally, I did work <clears throat> most of the time that I was in Cambridge really hard. Um, but then I would take periods of holidays where I went traveling with a, 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 a girlfriend from Melbourne and we traveled in Europe and and had a wonderful time and later I traveled with Jerry so for me um, work was was very exciting and and it was great to be at work but I also yeah. took a lot of downtime to do things like um, brass rubbing in Cambridge oh, yes. I didn't have a, I didn't have a car of course but when Jerry came along we would go together um, and do some um, some traveling around England, but uh, mostly in Europe. But we also had wonderful trips to London. Remember how cheap it was on the train then, Joan? You, oh, yeah. Even as a really starving PhD student, I would be able to go afford to go, if I saved my money and didn't eat luxuriously, I would be able to save my money, go down to London, go to the opera and come back in the same night. It was amazing that um, you could do that and then um, Jerry and I would go to London spend the weekend and we would go shopping for these amazing clothes on Carnaby Street and Chelsea Road and come back with well Jerry came back with a purple velvet suit for example <laughs> which was his pride possession for many years so, so uh, this lots was of fun <laughs> but also lots so of this work. was the early 70s are we talking about I, I um no we're talking about the late 60s wow so really um Beatlemania and everything absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. yes so just thinking about those period um in when you're both working incredibly hard on these challenging projects uh Joan can you remember you know, the, the, the first moment in that part of your career that, that gave you the most pleasure? Well, scientific I, moment. I, okay. So I worked on this project for about a year and it turns out that I was doing sort of not the right fractionation method in order to get the material that I needed to analyze. And, um, and then for some reason, I don't know, it was something in the literature or something somebody said to me and I was about to switch. And I remember having a conversation with Sidney Brenner and saying, I was gonna give this one more try and then I was gonna give up and did he have another project for me? And um, I remember Sidney saying, yes, sometimes experiments are like a bad marriage. You have to give them one last try before you give them up. <laughs> Uh, I'm not very good at imitating, uh, but that was, that was wonderful, and I tried it, and then it worked, and then everything from there on in, but this is often the case, you know, in, in science, as you know, is that you try something new that's a little bit different, and that makes all the difference, and then you're yeah. off running. And it was Suzanne, the same. Was the there... same thing happened to me too. Um, well, I, I just wanted to affirm what Joan said then, because <coughs> I was laboring away on the countercurrent distribution machines, which none of your readers will um, ever ever come across anymore. Um, and what what was going on was a totally different way of um, sequencing RNA. 
um, on with, that had been invented by Fred Sanger, and that was in the department upstairs. And so um, I desperately wanted to use that technology, learn how to do that technology instead of doing what I was doing. So, you know, even though I was making progress, progress was very slow. And I, um, but I don't remember how I managed to persuade my supervisor that we should change tack and that I should instead be allowed to um, use the new method. But um, that was key to my future, making, doing that push and changing direction, changing the, the technological approach that I was using because in fact, that um, approach worked out and I was able to sequence this tRNA that I was given to sequence at the beginning. I believe it was either the second or the third tRNA ever to be sequenced. And um, you asked what, what kind of moments I remember that um, were sort of eureka moments. And I do remember I, like working out the sequence was like doing a puzzle. And I still remember to this day exactly where I was in Cambridge walking on a Sunday afternoon when all of a sudden it occurred to me what the last piece of the puzzle was and I had the entire sequence. And in that moment, I was extremely joyful because I knew I had my PhD. I knew that I could um, now go back to Australia, which is what I was most wanting to do at that time, and that um, I had succeeded. Fantastic. So I can even remember the smells. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously these were extremely productive years. And, um, you know, obviously you, you've mentioned Nobel Prize winners in almost every sentence. It's it must have been the most inspiring environment so I'm sure it ha had a big impact on what you did next so by this stage were you already feeling very ambitious or was it still your scientific curiosity that was driving your um, path you know what you did next Joan, did you have a grand plan by this stage of what you wanted to do oh, next? Ab absolutely not. Even though I'd gotten a lot of recognition for having done, again, using the same methods that Suzanne used uh, to sequence now a piece of messenger RNA, not a piece of tRNA, or not a tRNA. Um, I had no expectations because as an undergraduate, I had, or a graduate student, I had never seen a woman science professor, nor a woman head of lab. And I expected that I would go back to the States and be a research associate in some man's lab. Not my husband's because I wasn't a crystallographer, but somebody else's and, you know, maybe they'd let me have a grad, you know, guide a graduate student. And that was, that was my expectation. And then it turned out that you know, people were more impressed than that and started offering me jobs. There was also a lot of pressure at that point from the US government for universities to change their nepotism policies that they had had since the Second World War, of, you know, not hiring more than one person from the same family. There was pressure to, to go in a different direction. And I think that made a significant difference. My goodness. Darren, tell the story of Berkeley. Tell the story. Well, okay. So my husband had already gotten a job, a, a faculty job, junior faculty job in Berkeley before we even went to England, expecting to stay there two years. And so we went back after two years and I went with him. And by that time I had done this nice work. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say it was my husband, not me who went along to the chair of the department and uh, put down letters on his desk of job offers that both of us had for independent faculty, junior faculty positions from several universities. And the, um, the chairman said to Tom, but all of our wives are research associates in our labs, they love it. <laughs> so we didn't stay at Berkeley and we came to Yale which was wonderful. Amazing. It's really amazing to think that <laughs> they gave you up. <laughs> How foolish they were. 
yeah, they'll, they've lived to regret it a million times over. Um, and Suzanne, what, what was obvious to you at that point? Um, were you ready to climb this very difficult ladder or um, I didn't, you, you I just didn't, really I didn't wanted... Even, yeah. I didn't even did you just... see the ladder. I didn't have, yeah. like Joan, I didn't have any um, any expectations, but I had fallen deeply in love with science. So I think for me, it was a matter of continuing to be able to discover things in science. And um, Jerry had already um, arranged a postdoc in Geneva. And so I applied with his advice, I applied for a postdoctoral fellowship and um, very unusually obtained one. It was an Australian um, postdoctoral fellowship. And so we went off together to Geneva to start our married life at that stage and to um, do science together, which was the beginning of us doing science together. And we've done it ever since. And Amazing. I think that um, without um, Jerry guiding me at that stage in my life, I would have probably drifted out of science. Maybe I would have become a lecturer back in Australia. Um, but I don't think that looking back at myself at that stage that I had the scientific confidence to um, ever think that I would be um, running a lab. So for me, it was just continuing um, a voyage of discovery um, and then lucking out and ending up with a wonderful scientific partnership. And I think through that partnership over the years, my confidence grew. But at the beginning, I was very lacking in confidence. And for, for me, it was the fact that, you know, there had been a couple of places that had offered us both faculty jobs and Berkeley was only offering one. And that sort of tore at my pride or something like that and made it possible to say yes to something that I didn't know whether it was possible or not. Cambridge was an incredible influence over certainly me, I'm sure, Joan uh, and Tom and Jerry. Um, because we looked around us, we saw all of these amazing Nobel laureates, but all, also all of these um, very ambitious, very talented postdocs from around the world, mostly from the US, but um, from around the world. And I think that <clears throat> being in that company of young postdocs who were striving to make discoveries and to make their names. I don't think anyone thought about, you know, heads of department or anything else at that stage. What we wanted to do was make great Science. discoveries and we were ambitious to do that. Um, and we gave each other mutual confidence, rubbing off each other's shoulders, or maybe it was through mutual um, competition. So after um, Jerry and I did very well in Geneva as postdocs together and um, made some excellent discoveries that were published in front rank journals. And um, so we had the confidence that we could continue as a partnership and that, but I really wanted to go back to Australia. My heart was there. I remembered suddenly about the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research, where Burnett had been the director until recently, and that and he, of course, was a Nobel laureate. But this was in a field we knew nothing about. <clears throat> this was in the field of immunology. But as soon as we walked into that place, it had the same atmosphere as the LMB in the sense that everyone was striving to um, striving at the frontiers of science and, and striving to compete with the rest of the world. So we decided that was the only place in Australia that we would work and that we would attempt to, dis, <laughs> to um, um, persuade the new director, Gus Nossel, that he needed us as molecular biologists because the Institute at that stage was totally cell, cellular immunology. No one, <laughs> there was there was no um, biochemistry or molecular biology being done there. And, and we 
so we we while we were postdocs in Geneva, we actually uh, and he he came across for a short sabbatical, and we um, had an interview with him. And he must have seen something that he liked because he offered us jobs as postdocs at the Walter and Liza Hall Institute. And we were, again, um, probably very um, naive and audacious, but we said we didn't want to be postdocs. We wanted to run our own lab. And he agreed. So um, we started from the beginning running our own lab together at the Walter and Liza Hall Institute in 1971. But what do you think are the main remaining barriers, um, you know, to women having the sort of pathways that, that you enjoyed? I think the most important phenomenon is what's called social identity threat or stereotype threat. And I still think that it's very relevant to sort of impeding women in proceeding in their careers. And what the phenomenon is, as described by cognitive uh, psychologists, is a feeling that all people, or a set of experiences that all people undergo if they feel that they are part of an undervalued minority. And so by definition, since there are fewer women in science than there are men, women are always being subjected to stereotype threat. And the cognitive psychologists, of course, studied what the manifestations of this are. Physiologically, you can imagine, you, you know, your heart rate goes up and your perspiration rate goes up. But psychologically, they've also documented that cognitive learning and memory and all sorts of things that are really, really important are impaired uh, when one has these feelings. So. When I look at, you know, and when I first learned about this in 2007, I look back and I realized why for 30 years, when I'd been asked to be on committee X and committee Y, and I would be the only woman and there'd be 10 men, I wouldn't dare say anything because mm -hmm. I was frightened stiff. And mm -hmm. so just knowing that this is a normal human response and men undergo this response too, if they're put into the situation of being in an undervalued minority, like white men versus black men in sports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that if you understand why you're reacting the way you're reacting, I think it helps you not to necessarily change things, but to overcome your own feelings of insecurity and allow you to go ahead. So I always tell young women who I'm, you know, rooting for in science about this because I want them to know that, you know, they very likely end up feeling this way and um, it's, it's a normal human response. What's really needed is societal change and that we need to give courage to girls um, <laughs> from the very earliest age because yeah. all, it, all what they need is courage. And yeah. um, and it should come naturally. It shouldn't. They shouldn't feel inferior, and others should not look at them as inferior. And they should expect to have um, careers as well as families. And they should expect to be able to manage both, and to have somebody alongside them that helps them manage both. But um, it, that's it's one of the most like important that. things. It's not like that. Is to find a supportive partner. That's absolutely, absolutely essential for success for women in science. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And we were very lucky, both of us, in that right. regard. Um, but uh, so, I think that affirmative action is probably necessary because the pace of change has been so slow. But on the other hand, if I look back in our um, lifetime in science. It has changed tremendously. It has changed tremendously. And there are the opportunities out there for women. But women have to first want those opportunities and they have to be able to succeed in those opportunities. I think it is very um, detrimental to the cause of women in science, if that's what we're talking about now, to um, have quotas in the sense that it's then possible for people to say, you only made it because there was a quota. And that is a very destructive attitude. 
But so I think that it's very important that we tell women that they need to be ambitious and to succeed. Joan, do you have any other suggestions to, how, what do you say to young women? What that... I say to them is, you know, try lots of different things in science if you think you're interested in science. And when you find something that really grabs you, then go for it and be persistent. And, uh, you know, don't get, don't get distracted and, you know, keep on, keep on going and you will succeed. I think one time when it's crucial is when, I mean, we, we both, all of us know that science is very intense. Right, and, and go up and down, but that if you keep pushing when you're in a trough and just keep doing it, it always comes back up again. And that's harder for a young person who hasn't experienced these troughs to understand. I think, you know, that is the hardest part. If you've got three children, for instance, and you want to be a lab head, that's tough. And I think you know, that's still a choice that some women make, that I'll take some years off and then I'll come back with a less ambitious plan for my career. Um, and so we, we still need to think of ways of, of supporting women not to make what I think could be a decision they would regret later on in their lives. Um, I mean, obviously, things like um, maternity leave payments and so on are, are improving. But, you know, there's no question that in most circumstances the, the research will slow up during that period. So Is there anything we can do with, about I agree that? With you, Joan. I, I agree with you, Um and so what I say to young women at that stage of their careers is that you have to be very focused. Um, you have to spend the time that you do have in a very focused manner so that you can be the most productive you can be at that time. But you have to be supported. Um, it, we, you have to be supported at home by your partner. Um, it should be really equal sharing. And that's easier, I think, um, if you're both scientists, but for most people, that's not true. And so, it's easier because you can appreciate why you need to, the other person needs to rush into the lab late at night, for example. Uh, and you can forgive that, but if you're, uh, if one of you is a lawyer and one, and, and one of you is a scientist and you both got these really high pressure jobs, it's, it's harder to support each other. Um, but, but it has to happen. Um, so I think that what is really important is that there's equal sharing of responsibilities during um, from both partners during um, when young families are around. And I think that um, employers need to give both of those partners a longer time to um, achieve The kind of papers that they need to progress in their um, their careers. I don't think I think it should be taken into account, and as it is in Australia, and I'm sure in the US too these days. But it didn't used to be. It used to be if you didn't get there to a certain point in your career by five years, you'd had it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think that exists anymore, and it should not exist anymore because I think that there's a period when it is much harder to be as productive and that we need to continue to support people during that difficult phase of their careers because we've invested so much in them and they have so much to offer that to to knowledge and to science and and to society so to let them slip out at this stage is a great waste yeah. we have to keep supporting them i agree entirely so let's um, change tack a little bit and think about some of the broader challenges in science. And I've been trying to think about whether there's anything positive that could possibly be gleaned from having been through this uh, pandemic. Um, Joan, what do you think this has taught us about, you know, the importance of clear scientific communication and, and real engagement with the community? Um, do you think 
scientists have done well during the last two years in, in kind of conveying scientific ideas and, and really, you know, telling people just how brilliant scientists are. You know, the fact that we could generate a vaccine in, in less than a year. Whenever I talk to people, I very clearly make the point that it was decades of fundamental research just into how cells work and to what messenger RNA does, because now everybody sort of thinks they know what messenger RNA is. And if it hadn't been for those fundamental discoveries, it never would have been 63 days from the sequence to phase one clinical trials for Moderna. No way. And I point out, you know, I try to point out to, to, to people if they're wanting to listen, you know, all the different things coming in from different angles that had to have been discovered in order to make that possible. I mean, I personally still find it absolutely remarkable that all that was there and it could just be harnessed so very quickly. And I feel, you know, I, I, know, I know that I've been doing fundamental research my entire life and I never expected to see it materialize in the way it has. Uh, and it's a wonderful reward. It, it is. And um, I mean, do, do you think that uh, has resulted in, in the community appreciating scientists more? I, I, I don't think we're far enough downstream to, to know that. I mean, yeah. I know that the US has just done something very stupid I think there was a congressional vote and preparedness for pandemics. Mm -hmm. I mean, now we've got it all set up. All we have to do is maintain it for the next mm -hmm. one. Whereas if we just let it go, um, then we'll have to start over again, which is insane. Uh, so I'm, I'm really hoping, but I guess we're not good enough at communicating. I think that um, science has been in the news so much more science and scientists has the pandemic has brought them to the fore um everybody is saying words that i didn't think they would ever learn <laughs> everyone in the general public that is um so i do think that there has been a period at least <clears throat> of great respect for scientists having developed the vaccine i mean I agree with both of you that it's an absolute miracle that it could have been done so fast and so effectively, and we're very fortunate. But as Joan said, that was not luck. It was through investment in basic science for decades. And we have to keep telling that message. As, as we have said during our entire lives to our politicians in particular, so that they will keep supporting science because we never know what's around the corner and how science will um, will tackle that. But we know that it it can and should. And so I think the major problem is to um, sustain a, an appropriate balance of support for science and science fundamental research. But not only that, I've been impressed by the epidemiologists and you know their contributions to this so it's all kinds of scientists that we need not just um basic scientists like yeah, joan and me remarkable. um we need to have a spectrum uh, right across we need to have wonderful um medical practitioners as well so but you know for a healthy society this is an incredibly important and valuable investment. But I think at least in Australia, politicians still do not get that message. Um, I think they might have believed in it during the, the most severe crisis, but they're letting it slide again now yeah. um, and yeah. they're turning their attention to other things. There will be always- We could do it once, other we could do it again, but that's silly. Yeah, yeah. so I, I do think we've had a place in the sun, but we should um, <laughs> endeavour through good science communication um, to keep selling that story. Absolutely. Yeah, we have to. Look, and I agree with you about the epidemiologists. Certainly, um, 
you know, Anthony Fauci and, and the, the various um, people like Catherine Bennett, who've spoken so eloquently uh, in Australia, they, they have a, a, a real talent of being able to say things clearly in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And that's not something we're all good at. Um, and it's not something that, you know, is easy to train either. But I think we all need to try and, um, you know, capture um, the attention of the community at large by speaking plainly. Joan, you've alluded to the fact that we don't have the infrastructure for the next pandemic necessarily. You know, we may have to tackle it in a completely different way and take advantage of other types of basic science that, that's already been done. It's not just going to be, you know, popping the thing in the plug and turning it on and the whole thing will solve again in 63 days. Um, yeah, I, I have, have had... Um, a lot to admire amongst our scientists, but I, I just don't think people have really got it that we're underfunded. We could do so much more if, if funding was more generous. I do think that science has been a victim of its own success. We have trained so many good people and there are so many good people that there's a much greater competition for the limited funding that there is now. And I think that makes it a very, um, <laughs> a very competitive mm -hmm. career to be in. And all I can say to young people is, if you really love this, if you have a passion for it, keep trying because you will succeed if you put your whole heart and soul into this career path. You know, it, it, it's such a delight to um, talk to women that, you know, after all these years are still as passionate as ever, still working, um, pursuing their um, scientific um, subjects with the same vigor as, as they have all along. Um, and yeah, clearly no regrets in, in this career choice. Well, I think you've done a wonderful job in sort of leading us in this discussion and uh, extracting these revelations. It's been wonderful to be able to talk with you, Joan, and that I hope that we see each other soon, no matter what continent. And yeah. thank you, Joan Heath, for um, getting us together and giving us this opportunity. Well,